Warning, Kind of Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kind of Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and moral corruption. We have a perilous journey ahead, so thank you for lending me your courage and good company. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg, and this is Kinda Murdery. Before we get started, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Audrey W. Thank you so much, Audrey, for the delicious Girl Scout cookies. All right, you have found your way to part two of The Watcher, 657 Broadway. That's right, I said part two, so if you haven't heard part one yet, go back and listen to it. We'll save you a seat. Also, please do call 888-MURDERY, that's 888-687-3379, to tell me your kind of murdery story so that you and your story can inspire an episode of the show. Okay. As I usually do, I'm going to rewind the story just a bit to let you settle back into the narrative. And now if you're ready without any further ado, I suggest that you put your personal items underneath the seat in front of you. Stow your carry-on in the overhead compartment. Let go of the worries of the day, but be sure your seatbelt is fastened. There's turbulence expected ahead. Kinda murderies. The Watcher, 657 Broadway, starts now. The Watcher was upset by new money moving into town. Quote, Are you one of those Hoboken transplants who are ruining Westfield? Unquote. And by the Broaddus' relatively modest renovations. Writing, The house is crying from all the pain it's going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You are stealing its history. It cries for the past and what it used to be in the time when I roamed its halls. The 60s were a good time for 657 Boulevard when I ran from one room to another, imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old and so did my father. But he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and I wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. Lanahan recommended looking into former housekeepers or their descendants. Perhaps the watcher was jealous that the Broadduses had bought a home that the writer could not afford. But the focus remained on the Langfords. In cooperation with the Westfield police, the Broadduses sent a letter to the Langfords announcing plans to tear down the house, hoping to prompt a response. Nothing happened. Detective Lugo brought Michael Langford in for a second interview but got nowhere, and his sister Abby accused the police of harassing their family. Eventually, the Broadduses hired Lee Levitt, a lawyer who met with several members of the Langford family as well as their attorney to show the letters, along with photos explaining how their home was one of the few vantage points from which the easel could be seen. The meeting grew tense and the Langfords insisted Michael was innocent. One night, Derek had a dream in which he confronted Peggy, the eldest Langford, and demanded she build an eight-foot fence around the properties. Maria was having other kinds of dreams. One night, she woke up to an especially vivid one about a man who lived nearby. He was wearing these boots and carrying a pitchfork and calling to the kids, and I couldn't get to them in time, Maria said. She thought almost anyone could be the Watcher, which made daily life feel like navigating a labyrinth of threats. She probed the faces of shoppers at Trader Joe's to see if they looked strangely at her kids and spent hours googling anyone who seemed suspicious. There were reasons to consider other suspects. For one thing, the police spoke to Michael before the second letter was sent, which would have made sending two more especially reckless. The Broadduses say that Lugo told them they wouldn't receive any more letters after he spoke to Michael. Then, there was the rest of the neighborhood to consider. The private investigator found two child sex offenders within a few blocks. Bill Woodward, the Broaddus' house painter, had also noticed something strange. The couple behind 657 Boulevard kept a pair of lawn chairs strangely close to the Broaddus' property. 
One day I was looking out the window and I saw this older guy sitting in one of the chairs, Woodward said. He was facing the Broadduses. But by the end of 2014, the investigation had stalled. The watcher had left no digital trail, no fingerprints, and no way to place someone at the scene of a crime that could have been hatched from pretty much any mailbox in northern New Jersey. The letters could be read closely for possible clues or dismissed as the nonsensical ramblings of a sociopath. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack, said Scott Krause, who helped investigate the case for the Union County Prosecutor's Office. In December, the Westfield police told the Broadduses they had run out of options. Derek showed the letters to his priest, who agreed to bless the house. The renovations to 657 Boulevard, including a new alarm system, were finished within a few months, but the idea of moving in filled the Broadduses with overwhelming anxiety. Could they let their kids play outside or have friends over? Would they get a new letter every week? Derek priced out trained German shepherds and posted a job on a website for military veterans. The posting said, All you have to do is work out in the backyard every day. But the Broadduses hadn't bought 657 to feel bunkered in a fortress. At the end of the day, it came down to, what are you willing to risk, Maria said. We weren't going to put our kids in harm's way. Derek had been responding to occasional alarms at the house, sometimes in the middle of the night, bringing a knife with him just in case. They were so joyous about their new home, and then within days, they were all petrified, Bill Woodward, the painter said. I'm a stranger, and Maria was crying and shaking in my arms. It didn't help that the watcher seemed to be getting more and more unhinged. 657 Boulevard is turning on me. It is coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend and now it is my enemy. I am in charge of 657 Boulevard. It is not in charge of me. I will fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this to pass and for you to bring the young blood back to me. 657 Boulevard needs young blood. It needs you. Come back. Let the young bloods play again like I once did. Let the young bloods sleep in 657 Boulevard. Stop changing it and let it alone. The Broadduses had sold their old home, so they moved in with Maria's parents while continuing to pay the mortgage and property taxes on 657 Boulevard. I had to do things like shovel the driveway, Derek Broaddus said. Just picture that little indignity. I'd go at five in the morning, then come back and do it again at my in-laws. They told only a handful of friends about the letters, which left others to ask why they weren't moving in. Legal issues, they said. The friends would wonder if the Broadduses were getting divorced. They fought constantly and started taking medication to fall asleep. I was a depressed wreck, Derek said. Maria decided to see a therapist after a routine doctor's visit that began with the question, How are you? caused her to burst into tears. The therapist said she was suffering from post-traumatic stress that wouldn't go away until they got rid of the house. Speaking of post-traumatic stress, depression, and other mental health issues, this seems like an appropriate spot to remind you about the free three-digit lifeline number 988 that you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to receive immediate counseling for substance use, mental health, or suicidal thoughts. So if you find yourself in crisis, please do call 988. Program it into your phone right now. And please, Always do remember that the world is a better place with you in it. You can also reach out to me. I would love to connect with you. Kindermurdery at gmail.com or at kindermurdery on all social media. Again, please don't reach out to me if you're in acute crisis. I'm not qualified for that, but if you just want to connect with someone, share your story, share your feelings, then I would love to connect with you. Also, another reminder Please do call 888-MURDERY and tell me your kind of murdery story so that you can inspire an episode of the show. All right, back to The Watcher. Six months after the letters arrived, the Broadduses decided to sell 657 Boulevard. They initially listed it for more than they paid to reflect the renovations they'd done. But few worlds are more gossipy than suburban New Jersey real estate, and rumors had already begun to swirl about the house that sat empty. One broker emailed to say that her client loved it, but that there were too many unsubstantiated rumors flying around ranging from a sexual predator to a stalker, and that they needed to know more. 
The Broadduses sent a partial disclosure mentioning the letters to interested buyers and told Coldwell Banker, their realtor, that they intended to show the full letters to anyone whose offer was accepted. Several preliminary bids came in well below the asking price, but the Broadduses weren't ready to take such a financial hit and only wanted to share the letters with likely buyers. No one got that far, even after they lowered the price. A Coldwell agent who hadn't read the letters told them in an email that they were being unnecessarily forthcoming. My friend got horrible threatening letters about her dog barking and she didn't think to disclose, the realtor said. But the Broadduses insisted. I don't know how you live through what we did and think you could do it to somebody else, Derek said. Derek and Maria thought about what they would have done had the previous owners told them about their letter from the Watcher. The Woodses, both retired scientists, told the Broadduses that they remembered the letter they received as more strange than threatening, thanking them for taking care of the house. They say they never had any issues and they certainly never felt watched. They rarely even locked their doors. But the Broadduses felt the name alone was ominous enough to merit mentioning to a new family moving in, and on June 2, 2015, a year after buying 657 Boulevard, they filed a legal complaint against the Woodses, arguing that the Woodses should have disclosed the letter just as they had the fact that water sometimes got in the basement. The Broadduses said they hoped to reach a quiet settlement. Their kids still didn't know about the Watcher, and their lawyer assured them that, at most, a small legal newswire might pick up the story. We do some creepy stories, Tamron Hall said on the Today Show a few weeks later. This might be top 10 creepy. A local reporter had found the complaint, which included snippets of the Watcher's menacing threats, and after a belated attempt by the Broadduses to seal it, the story went viral. News trucks camped out at 657 Boulevard, and one local reporter set up a lawn chair to conduct his own watch. The Broadduses got more than 300 media requests, but with advice from a crisis management consultant referred by one of Derek's colleagues, they decided not to speak publicly to spare their kids even more attention. They vacated Westfield and went to a friend's beach house. They didn't find much peace. Maria's grandfather had a heart attack, and the friend they were staying with had a seizure. Eventually, Derek and Maria sat down with their children to explain the real reason they hadn't moved into their home. The kids had plenty of questions. Who is the Watcher? Where does this person live? Why is this person angry with us? To which Derek and Maria had few answers. Can you imagine having that conversation with a five-year-old? Derek asked. Your town isn't as safe as you think it is, and there's a boogeyman obsessed with you. From a safer distance, the Watcher was a real-life mystery to solve. A commentator on NJ.com suggested ground-penetrating radar to find whatever the Watcher claimed was in the walls. The home inspector had already looked and told Derek the only issue was the aging home's lack of insulation. A group of Reddit users obsessed over Google Maps Street View, which showed a car parked in front of 657 that one user thought had a man holding a camera in the driver's seat. Others more rationally saw pixelated glare. The range of proposed subjects included a jilted mistress, a spurned realtor, a local high schooler's creative writing project, guerrilla marketing for a horror movie, and, quote, mall goths having fun, unquote. Mall goths having fun. Jeez, that's a stretch. Some people just thought the Broadduses were wimps for not moving in. I would never let this sicko stop me from moving into a house. Never back down from a terrorist, wrote one commenter, which irked the Broadduses. None of them have read the letters or had their children threatened by someone they didn't know, Derek said. To decide whether this person's only nuts enough to write these letters and not to do something, well, what if something did happen? In Westfield, people were on edge. Lori Clancy, who teaches piano lessons in her house behind 657 Boulevard, said that one of her students came for a lesson shortly after the news of the Watcher broke and started bawling. She was terrified to walk down the boulevard, Clancy said. At the first Westfield Town Council meeting after the letters became public, Mayor Andy Skibitsky assured the public that the Watcher hadn't been heard from in a year and that even though the police hadn't solved the case, their investigation had been exhaustive. This was news to 657's neighbors, most of whom had never heard from the cops. We are confounded as to how a thorough investigation can be conducted without talking to all the neighbors with proximity to the home, said several of them in a written letter to the local paper. 
I'd like to mention that I am also confounded. Every single one of the neighbors that lived even within walking or short driving distance of the Broadus' home ought to have been interviewed the same way that the Langfords were. I mean, that's just one podcaster's opinion, but obviously whoever was doing this lived very close to the Broadus' and there weren't that many people that lived very close to the Broadus'. And I also don't believe that any old Joe Schmo is going to really be mentally and emotionally strong enough to hold up and continue to lie under uh, police interrogation. I mean, I understand not wanting to upset the town, but in this case, this letter writer really was threatening the Broadus' children. Referring to them as young blood over and over can't exactly be ignored. And in light of direct threats to the family, in my opinion, there was a rather gross dereliction of duty that occurred here. It makes you wonder if it was maybe even one of the cops or town officials who was writing the letters. And after this general outcry from the neighbors, and the glare of national attention because of the Today Show and others, Baron Chambliss, a veteran detective in the Westfield Police, was asked to look into the case. The Broadduses are victims, and I don't think they got the support they needed. Chambliss, who has since retired, said recently. Chambliss knew his colleagues had looked closely at Michael Langford. According to his brother Sandy Langford, Michael had been diagnosed with schizophrenia as a young man. He sometimes spooked newcomers to the neighborhood when he did strange things, like walk through their backyard or peek into the windows of homes that were being renovated. But those who knew him said the odd things he did were usually just unusual neighborly kindness. He goes out and gets the newspapers for me every morning, said John Schmidt, who lives next door. People who had known Michael for decades didn't think he was capable of writing the letters. It sounds to me like somebody who knew Michael, and perhaps knew that he peeked in windows and was schizophrenic, may have been a sicko and essentially framing Michael Langford with the letters, which is super messed up. But again, that ought to be a pretty narrow suspect pool. As Chambliss looked into the case, he discovered something surprising. Investigators had eventually conducted a DNA analysis on one of the envelopes and determined that the DNA belonged to a woman. Chambliss decided to look more closely at Abby Langford, Michael's sister, who worked as a real estate agent. Was she upset about missing a commission right next door? She also worked at the local Lord and & Taylor, and Chambliss coordinated with a security guard there to nab her plastic water bottle during a shift. But Chambliss says the DNA was not a match. Not long after, the prosecutor's office gave Derek and Maria some unexpected news. They wouldn't say why or how, but they had ruled out the Langfords as suspects. The Broadduses were stunned. They had recently told the prosecutors that they planned to file civil charges against the Langfords, and they wondered if the prosecutors were lying to prevent the story from blowing up again. My family moved to the boulevard in 1961, and we never caused a problem for anybody, Sandy Langford said. This guy gets all these letters, and all of a sudden, people are pointing figures. Left without a suspect, the Broadduses reopened their personal investigation. They were still coy about sharing too much with the neighbors who remained in the pool of suspects. But spent an afternoon walking the block with a picture of the watcher's handwritten envelope. They hoped someone might recognize the writing from a Christmas card. But the only notable encounter came when an older man who lived behind 657 said his son joked that the watcher sounded a little bit like him. A neighbor across the street was the CEO of Kroll, the security firm, and the Broadduses hired the company to look for handwriting matches, but they found nothing. They also hired Robert Leonard, a renowned forensic linguist and former member of the band Shanana who didn't find any noteworthy overlap when he scoured local online forums for similarities to the Watcher's writing, although he did think the author might watch Game of Thrones. At one point, Derek persuaded a friend in tech to connect him to a hacker willing to try to break into Wi-Fi networks in the neighborhood to look for incriminating documents. But doing so turned out to be both illegal and more difficult than the movies made it seem, so they didn't go through with it. Meanwhile, Chambliss and the Westfield police were also back at square one. The cops asked Andrea Woods for a DNA sample and interviewed her 21-year-old son, who was surprised to find that he'd suddenly become a suspect. A year after the fact, it was hard to find fresh leads, and the initial police canvas had been so porous that it had missed a significant clue. Around the same time that the Broadduses had received their first letter, another family on the boulevard got a similar note from The Watcher. 
The parents of that family had lived in their house for years and their kids were grown, so they just threw the letter away, just as the Woodses had. But after the news broke, one of their children posted about it on Facebook, then deleted the post. When investigators spoke to the family, they confirmed that the letter had been similar to the Broadduses, but its existence made the case more confusing. There wasn't a whole lot to go on, said Chambliss. One night, Chambliss and a partner were sitting in the back of a van parked on the boulevard watching the house through a pair of binoculars. Around 11 p.m., a car stopped in front of the house long enough for Chambliss to grow suspicious. He traced the car to a young woman in a nearby town whose boyfriend lived on the same block as 657. The woman told Chambliss her boyfriend was into some, quote, really dark video games, including one in which he played as a specific character called The Watcher. As for the female DNA, Chambliss figured the girlfriend or someone else could have helped. The boyfriend was living elsewhere at the time, but Chambliss said he agreed to come in for an interview on two separate occasions. He didn't show up either time. And if you'd like to hear more, you'll have to tune in this Sunday, March 19th, for Part 3, The Thrilling Conclusion of The Watcher, 657 Boulevard. Remember, call 888-MURDERY, that's 888-687-3379, and tell me your kind of murdery story. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kind of Murdery. See you Sunday. See you Sunday.